G'day Unity Water, happy are you okay day? How you doing? My name's Justin Gange. I'm a plumber by trade, uh, but I'm also a community ambassador for Are You OK? And so I'm really grateful and thankful that yeah, you're taking 5, 10, 15 minutes out of today um, just to have a yarn about stuff that might matter um, to, to people in your workforce. So that's fantastic. Do you know what? Today is Are You OK? Day, but every day of my book is, should be Are You OK? Day. Simple message, checking in on a mate, on a friend, on a family member who might be struggling or doing it tough. Um, so I just wanted today to, to share a little bit of my story, my reasons for why I'm so passionate about um, having these conversations and, and hopefully leave you with four tools that you can put into your toolkit um, on how you can have a conversation with a mate, a friend, a family member if they're struggling or doing it tough and how you get, can get them to help. Okay, so let's go from the top. I was born at an early age in a little country town called Auckland, New Zealand. Um, now, I, I love my dad, my mum and my dad, and um, I, I wanted to be like my dad. You know, that's that's where it all started. He was the entertainer. Everyone loved my dad. He would um, he'd be one of those annoying people that would um, agree with everyone. You know, those people. Yeah, that was my dad. Um, and so, from an early age, I I, I, I entertained. I, I jumped on stage um, singing in pubs and clubs and all all the sort all around um, the, the the top of the North Island and stuff like that. Um, that that sort of journey led me to to um, having a few struggles, you know, um, relationship wise and um, with drugs and alcohol and things like that. And so I found myself going in and out of hospitals um, after trying to take my life, rehab, you know, breakdowns, all those sort of things, all before I was seventeen. Um, and so yeah, those early years were a, um, a really big learning lesson for me. Um, seventeen years old. I, I jumped on over across the ditch to Australia and um, I tried entertaining over here, but I, I, was, I was crap. <laughs> um, and so I had to get into the, um, the, the, into the only industry that I had skills for, which was no skills at all. And, um, and so I started labouring all around different parts of construction. Now, I wanted to be an electrician, but my dad said, no, get a trade first, son. <laughs> so I, uh, all the electricians in the house... Um, so I became a plumber. 1994, I got an apprenticeship um, and I became a plumber. Um, and I love my industry. I love the smell of sewage on a Monday morning slapping me around. That's what it's all about. I love this industry because you know, there's so many characters, so many cool, cool people uh, with so many great stories. And I, and I learned to, to love and listen to people. And um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. So um, wind the clock forward a few years and uh, you know I get my trade uh, license. Um, I, I become a... Um, I climbed the ladder at work. Also had my own, own plumbing business, Jelly Belly Plumbing. You poke them, we choke them. You know, it may be sewage to you, but it's bread and butter to me. Those are all my catch cries. Um, and, and so I had all of this stuff going on in the background. Now, I got married. In 1994, I met a beautiful lady. We got married. 1994 um, was when I also first started mascotting for that incredible um, rugby league team known as the Brisbane Broncos. Um, and, and I spent 17, years, 17, 18 years there, jumping out at Suncorp Stadium, you know, going down to Sydney for a few grand finals and all that sort of stuff. So it was absolutely sensational. Um, and at work, I was climbing the ladder. I was doing pretty good. Um, and I got to the year 2012. And 2012 was a really interesting time in my life because I thought I was bulletproof, you know. I was doing all sorts of things. I was running from a local seat in the state election. I live in a um, little place called Logan here in, um, in, in southeast Queensland. And I ran from a seat of Woodridge. I got 8% of the vote. Giddy up. I thought I was hot. Um, later that year, I also went on a little show called Australia's Got Talent. Um, I dressed up as Buck the Bronco, went on and I sang uh, Mustang Sally and um, yeah, got through to the semifinals and everything like that. Um, all the while still going to work and putting in some pretty big hours. And um, I got to the end of 2012 and, and um, I was cooked. You know, I was spent. I, I'd been spending so much time doing so many things that, 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 that the fuel tank had run dry. And, and um, I had a good boss because he, he was really always transparent with me and he started um, to notice that, that, that I wasn't doing okay. Um, now, he, um, he, he would do things. He'd take you, take you out for coffee quite a lot. 
and and he'd talk to you, you know, you know, what's going on, mate? And I'm seeing you, you're doing some stuff that's not like you, and you're saying stuff that's not like you. I'm worried about you. What's going on? Are you okay? Now I was a typical bloke. I I, I said, nah, mate. Yeah, nah. I did an Alfie. I said, yeah, nah. I'm all right, mate. Yeah, nah. Yeah, nah. Um, now I wasn't. I wasn't all right. Um, so he kept taking me out for coffee so many times I actually had to go into skinny milk because I was starting to bloat, you know. Um, and so finally I said, nah, mate, I'm done. I'm cooked. I can't do this anymore. Can't put the mask on anymore. Um, I'm struggling and I don't know what to do. He says, well, finally, finally. And so we had a bit of a yarn. He listened to me and then and he got to the point where he said, you know what, mate, I'm, I, I don't know what to do. How about we go and make a phone call? And so we went back to his office and, and um, he, he got on the blower and um, called my local doctor. Now, um, I picked the phone up from there and um, the doctor said, oh, you, you probably need to talk to a psychologist or something or a counsellor. And, and, and unbeknownst to him, I actually was. I was seeing a counsellor on the side and I rang her and she said, look, um, from what you're telling me, I think you need to go to your local hospital, um, go to the emergency section. And so... So we got my wife out and she took me down to the local hospital. Um, and it was in that hospital um, where I ended up getting diagnosed with a, with, with a mental illness of bipolar type 2. Um, and that was the start. That was the start of, um, of, of actually this conversation. Uh, because I had lots of mates that visited me in that hospital and worried about me and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and I didn't have the energy or capacity to, you know, just pretend like everything was okay. So it became pretty transparent. Um, and, and so I shared all my reasons for, for why I was feeling like I was feeling. And, um, and, and what I found out, that, that transparency actually gave permission. It gave space and the ability for my mates to share stuff back in return. Um, and, then, and that's what I realised, how important a conversation, a real fair dinkum, genuine conversation about the real stuff in life, all the tough stuff in life, warts and all, um, how much that can actually help us all have these conversations, break down that stigma and stuff. And so, look, you know, my, my life has journeyed on, you know, I've been, I think I was on holy moly earlier on in the year and um, doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but here doing, with the ability to do all that sort of stuff, primarily because a mate cared enough to ask, are you okay? And be fair dinkum and real enough to continue even when I wasn't giving them the stuff in return. So that's my, my journey, a little piece of it anyway. And I just wanted to use that journey just, just to talk about our conversation. So the are you okay conversation has been going on for years. You know, I remember in the early days, people going, oh, are you okay? You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, um, you know, just taking it at real, real surface level. And, um, um, but I've seen that change. I've seen that switch flicked. And so I just want today to give you the confidence and a few tools and few skills for you to have that conversation. Chances are when you're sitting here listening to me sharing this, it might be bringing up some people in your world that you might be worried about. So I want to kick it off by um, talking about how do we have the conversation? We've got a sign behind me here saying, trust the signs. What do you mean by signs, Justin? Well, what I mean is, you know, since I was knee high to a caterpillar, um, I was taught that I don't put my hand up when I struggle. You know, my dad taught me that, his dad before him taught him as well. So we don't do that. We don't, we don't reach out for that help because it, it, it's been ingrained in us um, not to. So what we come at, we come at it as um, help offering. You know, noticing when your mate might be struggling. And we say signs. People do things differently. You know, they don't come out and say, hey, I'm struggling. A lot of the time they do things differently. And we call these things signs. You know, they, they, they might, um, you know, for me, I'd be always measuring twice, cutting once, you know, and then all of a sudden they, they noticed that my, that I was off, that I wasn't doing that. And I'd say and stuff like, oh, that'll look good from the tweet heads, you know. And so we, we know that people do di things differently, um, consciously or subconsciously. And so we start picking up on that. And my boss picked me up. He said, no, Justin, you're doing that. That's not like you. You're saying those sort of things. That's not like you. So he was using all those signs as, as reasons to ask me, are you okay? And, you know, he got, got to the end there, he goes, you're doing that, you're saying that, that's not like you, what's going on, are you okay? That's all he had to ask. And then the next bit, so that's, that's the first step, ask, are you okay? 
using the signs. So he asked, and, I, and look, like I said, I was always, oh, yeah, no, nah, I'm all right. Yeah, no, nah, yeah, no. Nah. But he kept on me. And, and the fact that he kept on me actually gave me a little seed of hope, even as tough as I was doing it, that someone gave a rip about me. And that was so important. And so when I finally said, no, nah, mate, I'm, I'm not okay. And then he, sa- he, he said, oh, tell me what's going on. See, the next step in the conversation is listen. Listen without judgment. You know, look, um, I always go, you know, you go into anywhere, you start telling a story and everyone's got a thousand and one better stories than you, you know, okay? When you're asking someone, are you okay? This is the time to listen, to understand, not listen to respond, you know? As a plumber, I love fixing stuff. But as a mate, worried about a mate, asking them if they are okay. This is, this is where I listen to understand, not listen to judge. I remember when I was in hospital, when people were coming in asking me why, I didn't want anyone to fix me right then. I actually just wanted to be heard. I wanted people to understand why I was feeling like I was feeling. I wanted them to empathise with me, not compare it to stuff they were going through. So listen without judgment. Listen to understand, not to respond. So that's the second part of the Are You OK conversation. The third part is so important. Encourage action. OK, there we go. Encourage action. Now, my boss is great. He was perfect. He said, look, I, I don't know what to do. How about we get you to help? You know, a lot of people come to me and say, Justin, you know, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to ask someone if, I, you know, are you OK in case they say they're not? Well, the beauty of this conversation is actually you don't have to be a counsellor. You don't have to be a psychologist, a social worker or anything like that. You just have to care. You have to take 10 seconds of courage to care enough to ask the question, listen um, without judgment, and then encourage action. And that's what my boss did. He said, Justin, I don't know what to do. How about we go and make a call? Yeah, we're so privileged in Australia. We've got so many um, avenues, so, so many resources of help available to us. But when you're doing it tough, when you're stuck in the custard, the last thing you want to do is go into Dr. Google and sort yourself out. So a, a, a number's never saved a person. People save people, right? So my boss did the great thing. He said, how about we go and make a call? He dialed that number for me. Because I know that those, those telephones can feel like a lump of concrete when you're struggling or doing it tough. And so he dialed that number for me. That's what you can do as a mate. How, you know, I always go, man, you've got a bit going on there. Who's the best person to keep you safe right now? Have you got a plan? You know, some people might have someone they trust. It could be their, their partner. It could be their footy coach. It could be their um, surf um, club. It could be someone down at the bowls club, down at their church. So I always ask, who's the best person to keep you safe right now? Or, if, you know, how about we make a call to someone that can keep you safe? I've talked to many people who said, look, I've got no one, I've got no family, I've got no friends, I've got no one, mate. Oh, it's really tough. Well, how about we, we, we call one of these amazing life uh, amazing resources? And, and I've always got a few on my phone. So I'll go, you know, well, what about Lifeline? How about we give Lifeline a call? Maybe Beyond Blue. And I'll make the call for you, mate. But let's do this together. You know, um, shoulder to shoulder, side by side. We can do this stuff together. And so, yeah, yeah, man, you've got a bit going on there. I'm just a dodgy old plumber from Logan. How about we call someone that can help keep you safe? Let's encourage that action. Now, that, that, that's easy. Make that call and then we can get that person to help. That's what my boss did for me. And finally, the fourth part, the fourth step of the conversation is check in. Or as we say in New Zealand, check in, bro, check in. And this is super important because it lets the person know that you care. You know, that you're not just another notch on their belt or anything like that. This is about, hey, hey, bro, you know, how you going, mate? Did you get to see that counsellor? Did you have that talk with that person that you trust? Did you, you know, how's that working for you? Now, look, I've been battling mental, uh, mental illness and um, suicidality for over 30 years. Now, I've had some fantastic counsellors um, over that time, and I've had some real dodgy ones, sadly, as well. So a check-in is one of those things that we can actually keep on top. Mate, how did that go? Did it work? Because, I've, I've, you know, as I said, I've had plenty that, that have been pretty dodgy. And so, so it, it, it's about saying, I, I've, got a, I've got this saying, look, if I have a bad pizza, I don't stop eating pizza, I go to a different pizza shop. You know what I mean? Okay, so we, we're going to have those um, counsellors or, um, you know, people you trust that you talk to that you don't really see eye to eye on. 
And so it's simply about checking in. Is that working? If it's not, how about we try something different? Let's go to another person over here and, and, and just take that simple, simple moment to A, lets them know that you care. B, it lets them know that you're still there. They're not alone. You're doing this together. And C, it might change and actually get them to a, a, a more effective um, resource service that can actually help them. So those are the four steps to the conversation. Yeah, trust the signs. Ask, are you okay? Listen without judgment. Listen to understand, not listen to respond. Encourage action. Man, you've got a bit going on there. I don't know what to do. As I said, I'm just a dodgy old plumber. I reckon we need to call someone to actually help keep you safe, maybe help you um, get out of what you're going through at the moment. And then four, check in, brew. Check in. Remember, you know, how's that working for you? Hope it's going okay. If it's not, hey, let's try something different. So those are the four simple steps of are you okay? And this year, the, the, our campaign is are you really okay? You know, like, like my boss kept asking me, kept on me, kept on my back. Mate, I'm worried about you. Are you really okay? You're saying no. Are you saying yes? But I reckon you're not. And, and because he was persistent, because he asked genuinely, fair dinkum, real, it got me to the help I needed. And so that's my story. That's a little bit of my story. That's our conversation starter. I hope you have a fantastic day. And I want to challenge you right now. Who can you check in on tonight? Who can you trust the signs with to have a conversation, to ask, are you okay? Listen without judgment. Encourage action and check in on tonight. So that's my challenge to you. Do something. Find someone. It could be someone at work. It could be someone at home. It could be someone in your community. But 10 seconds of courage is all it takes to possibly change someone's life. So I hope you have a fantastic day. But remember, every day should be Are You Okay Day. Take care, look after you and look after the people in your world. Cheers, Pete.